You're watching a video from the Alley Church, located in Cottage Grove, Minnesota. Yes, so today I want to just put some precursors out here that <clears throat> we're not ending a series. And uh, I'm a baseball fitness fan, so I'm not fourth and back to clean it up. But this is where we look today as we look at the vertical. This is, these are the pillars of the church. Uh, as Pastor Ben has been talking and has, as he, he's reiterated a lot that right now in this moment that we all should have a vertical church. Every church should be a vertical church. So these pillars that we are, we're talking about aren't pillars that we, we just have once in a while and we look back at six months from now, we're like, man, that was a good message. No, when we get lost or confused or upset, we go back to these pillars and we say, all right, this is where we're going. This is where we're at. This is the this is direction that we're supposed to be going in. And so I love that because I use core values like that for our church. Like when anybody has a problem, we point them to the core values. This is what Pastor Ben is saying. We're a vertical church. We're a vertical church. And what does that mean? So it means this. So will everybody repeat with me? If you're new here today, welcome to the alley. And as you, as you repeat these words, we ask the new people that you say it louder than the people that regularly come so we know that you're saying them. So it says, let God himself be the main attraction at church. Come on, God. I'm going to start all over again. We're saying this together. Let God himself be the main attraction at church again. Let us be tireless in our insistence that church is for God, about God, through God, and to the glory of his great son. Hallelujah. So we, got, we have our pillars, unapologetic preaching, unashamed adoration, unceasing prayer, unafraid witness, unrelenting love, and unity and diversity. Today, let me just tell you a little bit before. I know a little bit about unity and diversity. If you've ever been married, you know a little bit more than the ones that don't. Me and, when me and Melanie got married, we were two diverse people. I know we may look alike, but sometimes we may sound alike, but we were really diverse. When I started, I started in our marriage, it was so diverse that I said, you know, I got to do something about this. And so I said, let's, uh, I didn't tell the first service, but I said, let's take communion. I don't know what's going on with us. So we started to take communion, and the Lord delivered us in that first year, and we were just so happy about that. So that's what happens. Unity and diversity is bringing glory to God together while celebrating differences. If your wife is different from you, you understand this already. So we're going to be talking about vertical. So if you could go in your Bible, we're going to be in Galatians 3, 19 through 28. If you have the version app, it's right there. Uh, and so unity of diversity, it says this, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. So the big idea today is we have a mediator who mediates for all in the new covenant. And Galatians 3.19 says it just like this. Why then the law? It was added because of transgressions until the offspring should come to whom the promises have been made. And it was put in place through angels by an intermediary. Now, intermediary implies more than one. But God is one. Is the law that contrary to the promises of God? Certainly not. For if a law had been given that could give life, then righteousness would indeed be by the law. But the scripture imprisoned everything under sin, so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Now, before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then the law was, was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. 
For as many of you were baptized into Christ have been put on by Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female. For you are all one in Christ. Today I have four questions that are going to explain why, why unity and diversity is a pillar. What does it mean to have unity in diversity? What does unity look like to have as a pillar? What does Jesus say about unity and diversity? And how can we celebrate what Jesus says about unity and diversity? See, we all have this narrative, this story about how we share what unity means to us. Everyone has a different kind of story that they share. And so today I'm going to just share this thing called missional narrative. And I'm going to define it for you. It says a missional narrative is a lens or a motivational story used to mobilize people for the Great Commission. And it's found at the intersection of the Missio Dei, their personal group of background, and the context where they are called to do ministry. This is who we are. Like we see this image. Put that image up behind me. So this is the image. We all have an intersection about how we have this story that we tell about the Great Commission of Jesus. And then we have this diagram. So there's people in the room who are children of boomers, who grew up and understand the institutional memory of the 40s and 50s. Your ministry context is denominations, church growth, and revivalism. Your mission your day, the, the mission of God has put on you is cultural transformation. What that means is you, you just don't like this postmodern world. You're saying this postmodern world needs to come to Jesus. Every time they come up with a new fad or a new wave, you're saying, nope, they need to come to Jesus. I don't even know what they're talking about. And so your missional narrative is saying the church is in decline. The issue of what, what the church looks like is in decline right now. And then there's people like me, children of communities that have experienced generational marginalization. See, we like faith to the nations. We're grassroots. We believe in diversity and inclusion. One of our taglines is our neighborhood, our church. This is me. We want to reconcile all those to Christ. That is the main focus. If you know if anybody knows me, I'm passionate about reconciliation. I'm passionate about diversion and inclusion. And my missional narrative is always reconciliation and justice narrative. We, we, we have these narratives. And if you don't agree with the narrative, sorry, it's you. Every time you try to run away from it, you're going to turn right back to it. You know you don't like the postmodern world. You like the world where everybody went to church on Sunday, where nobody was playing games on Sunday, where there's no sports on Sunday. You said this world has changed. And then you got people who are hippie kids. Who, who parents were hippies out here? Oh, none of y'all, all right. In Georgia, they all hippies. And so the hippie kids who like the public square and activism and nature. And then they say they like new creation. They like the image of God. They say, man, we can just do everything for the common good. We want peace everywhere we go. And then there's children of immigrants, people who are not from this place, who have a language-specific culture, and they're, they're the second generation. And they say, I want to be, I, know, I, I reach out to those who are exiled, who are what we call the diaspora, who are, who are spread out. And then they say, we want to show people that we can be church too. We want to arrive and be fulfilled in the narrative and say, we're here, look at us. And so we see these opportunities and we see these people who have these missional narratives. And what I'm, what I'm saying is that these people may be diverse, but they still serve the same God. It's still the same church. Just because we seem a little bit social justice or somebody sees more church growth doesn't mean their missional narrative has stopped them from being in unity. So if you feel like you fit in one of these categories, that doesn't mean that you, that you don't believe in unity. That believes we already know who you are. So we want you to be unified in who you are. And my second question is, what does it mean to have unity and diversity? And Paul said it like this. He says, why then the law? It was added because of transgressions. Under the offspring should come to whom the promise have been made. And it was put in place through angels by the intermediary. 
Now, intermediary implies more than one, but God, we are sinners. We're all sinners. And Paul is saying that we were guarded by the law because we were sinners. This was the only thing that could keep us in line. And God knew that there had to be an atonement for the sins. Even though we knew the law could never be fulfilled by us, we break the law all the time. Even today, who's ran a stop sign this week? Because it's snowing, we done broke the law. We always break the law. Who didn't want to shovel their sidewalk knowing that you're going to get a ticket if the city comes by? We break the law constantly. This is something that we all do. If you, I done ran a couple of stop signs because the brakes done wouldn't, wouldn't work my way. I'm like, I hope nobody's on the other side. You know, this is what happens. That's my wife back there calling the phone. <laughs> but we were shut in by our sin. We were shut in by this law. That means that we were all around us. We knew that sin was abounding, but this law was continually being broken. And, and God said there had to be an intermediary. There had to be somebody, something, some, some person that was going to come in and change all that. And as we talk about what does it mean to have unity, this, this intermediary would come in. And so as this intermediary came in, his name was Jesus. And he started to become our mediator. I don't know about you, I remember growing up in a false religion, and I remember this moment when I knew there was no salvation, and it was just this law, and it was just these ordinances, and it was just these things that I was just walking through, and there was no hope in it. There was no life in it. There was no transformation in it. And there's people that live out and living in unity and diversity, and they're like, man, I'm just going by this thing. And like I remember when you talk to somebody who's never tasted the hope of Jesus, who's never tasted it, they're like, anything goes for them. Anything matters to them. And it's just so, so heartbreaking to see no hope in people. And see, that's where I see people, that's why we don't have unity, because they haven't even seen the mediator yet. And it says it like this. This is what it looks like to have a mediator. In 1 Timothy 2.5, it says, For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, and the man is Christ Jesus. But as it is, it says this in Hebrews 8.6, but as it is, Christ has attained a ministry that's much more excellent than the old, much more excellent than the law. He mediates is better since it's intacted on better promises. If we're sinners and we break the law, Jesus has better promises for us. Listen, you run a stop sign, you break the law, you may go to jail. You have a better promise with Jesus, you break the law, he forgives you, you go to heaven. <laughs> it's a better promise just to make it that simple therefore he is a mediator of a new covenant that those who are called may receive the promise eternal inheritance that since death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant we have been redeemed from an old law and this is the one I love. I'm probably going to say it five or six times. And to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word. A better word than the words that were said to you. A better word that made you feel uh, marginalized. A better word that made you feel singled out. A better word that made you feel down and out and depressed. A better word speaks to your life. A better word when he becomes the mediator in your life. He's the one that brings unity in the faith. There's a better word, and that better word is Jesus. It was better than the blood of Abel. The brother who killed his brother for what he had, who coveted for what his brother had. We no longer have to covet because we share in the inheritance of Jesus and his blood shares a better word. Can I get an amen? amen? What does Jesus say about unity and diversity? There's this story that just grabs my heart. It's in Luke and it's about Zacchaeus. It's this tax collector who just scurries up this tree. He knows his life is in shambles. He knows he's greedy. He knows he's doing the wrong thing. But he knows. He's heard this story about Jesus. If I could just get a glimpse of hope from him. So he scurries up this tree. And all of a sudden, he sees Jesus. He sees Jesus for far off. Then Jesus is coming to walk by. Then he looks at him. 
And he says, Zacchaeus, I'm coming to your house. He comes down, and Jesus is sitting at the table with Zacchaeus. And what is Jesus doing at the table? He's he's reconciling sinners and tax collectors and publicans and prostitutes. He's doing all that right now at the table. And Zacchaeus says, man, because of this, Jesus, what I'm going to do, I'm going to give back four times of everything I cheated on people. Then I'm going to do this. I'm going to give half of everything I got after that to the poor. I don't know about you guys, but if that was my last day of job, I wouldn't be doing that. He quit his job and gave everything away. And Jesus said, I came to seek and save the lost. And that is the point of his table. That is what unity looks like to Jesus. Everyone. I grew up down south, and and some of you know every church used to say, whosoever. I haven't heard that in a long time. Whosoever come, Jesus will save them. Whosoever walk through the doors, whosoever sits at the table of communion will be unified in Jesus. And then how can we celebrate Jesus? How can we celebrate this awesome Jesus that we're living in? How can we continue to see like this communion table happen? I think about the 12 disciples. I think about how diverse they were, how at odds they were, how different they were, how young they were. I think about Peter, who was just a hothead. No matter what he did, he was a hothead. He was ready to cut somebody all the time. I don't know about you. And then he was always, he was always saying things that Jesus was like, come on, Peter. You know, and then there was, then it was, uh, then it was the brother, apostle of love. There was John. John was our hippie. He just always wanted to be next to Jesus. He just always wanted to love on Jesus. Kind of cling, stage five clinger kind of guy. Like, Jesus, I love you. You know, I just want to be around you the whole time. Jesus dealing with these people. Then he's got people who are zealots, who are, who are political, political activists. Who are saying, Jesus, we know you're here, we're your disciples, we can't wait till you turn this kingdom upside down. There are people who always had their own agenda, and Jesus had all of them at the table. He had those who were, who were not right, he had those who were half right, he had those who were some right. But he didn't have any of them that were right. And as we look at people and we talk about unity and diversity, we don't see everybody's right. Every generation is not right on what they mean in in unity and diversity. But if we all get together and understand we have a mediator, we have this mediator who speaks a better word. We have a mediator who looks at our life, looks at our community, looks at our neighborhood and says, I got a better word looks at all the things that are going on in our life. I was just thinking of how polarized our communities are. If we have Jesus, we have a better word. When we speak to our neighbor, and Paul says, how can we celebrate what Jesus says about unity and diversity? And Paul says it like this. There's neither Jew nor Greek. I grew up in a place called New Jersey where we had Jewish people all the time. We had Sephardic Jews and we had Hasidic Jews. Hasidic Jews were more orthodox. They wore yarmulkes and they had the curl in their hair. And then you had Sephardic Jews who just wear, who were, who were just, who were just a little bit looser than them. They're a little bit darker skin. They look different. And I would always ask my dad, I said, dad, what's the difference? Like, what's the difference? He said, you need to ask them. <laughs> so I asked one of them. I said, hey, what's the difference? They say, they, they wash their hands differently. They don't, wear, they don't wear undergarment the same. They, follow, they look totally different, but they were the same Jews. They said, they're a little bit more Jewish or not Jewish or not Jewish at all. But they all buy kosher food, so it makes it good. I worked at a kosher grocery store, so I was able to ask those type of questions. But he said, neither Jew nor Greek. When I looked at them, and I wasn't even saved yet, and I looked, I said, man, this is crazy. Neither Jew nor Greek. When I look at this verse, it says, neither Jew nor Greek. Neither you or me. Neither black or white. Neither Ethiopian or Liberian. Neither Jew or Greek. 
There is neither slave nor free. This hurts me. Like, I was like, neither slave nor free. It means there's no difference at the table of God of your social status, whether you're in bondage or not in bondage. There's a place at the table for you. And then he says, no male or female. This is the commentary say, Christianity is the only religion that honors women. It's the only religion that lets women sit at the table and not keep them in a back room or clouded up or shrouded up. I said, my gosh, the beauty that Christianity brings to all people who says we need to unify. He said, it's at the table. And then he says, for you, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. He doesn't say the people that are going to come after you. He says, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And as we look at how we celebrate Jesus, we celebrate Jesus because he's the mediator. And he has a better word. We celebrate Jesus in this moment. As you see, as you see the world on his axis. <laughs> as you see things happening, you just don't get it. We look and we say, Jesus speaks a better word. When we talk about unity and diversity as our pillar, when we come different, we look different, we talk different, we think different, we come together as brothers and sisters because Jesus has a better word. I remember I was going to Bible college down south, and I was, I, we were talking to brothers. And I went to, basically everybody was all white. And so I was the only black guy, and they were like, we have one common denominator. Carl, we're totally different from you in every retrospect. And they said, Jesus. We never had an argument. We never had a fight. We never had a hateful word to say. We could always speak to each other. We could hug. We slept in the same van. We, we stunk the same. We, we cleaved the same. Nobody ever said, I don't want to sleep with Carl because he snores. Nobody said none of that. They said, we have one common denominator. We're living through the tension, and we're living through the trial, and we're saying Jesus is our mediator. See, that's what unity and diversity means. It doesn't mean that you stay away from those that don't look like you, smell like you, talk like you. That means you embrace them because they still sit at the same table that you sit at. And Paul is saying we celebrate that. We celebrate the difference. Thank you for listening to this podcast from The Alley Church. More can be found at thealley.org. Follow Jesus, live love.